Thanks, and I am honored to be your keynote speaker today. Today, I'm going to talk about mastering the economics of data analytics and digital transformation. And I'm going to share with you an approach that you can adopt that takes a business-centric, ROI-driven approach to how organizations could build out their data and analytic assets. So let's dive right into this. I love this phrase, data is the new oil. I think this is a very powerful phrase. And it's not because data is literally oil. And there's a, a lot of people who sort of get uh, bent out of shape on this phrase. But let me explain to you why I think this phrase is the single most important phrase of our generation. In the same way that oil was the fuel that drove the economic growth in the 20th century, data, data will be that catalyst that drives the economic growth in the 21st century. Let me say that again to be really clear. In the same way that oil was the fuel that drove the economic growth in the 20th, 20th century, we will see data to be that catalyst to drive the economic growth in the 21st century. And that's why this statement is so important. Because in the first time since I've been involved in this industry for nearly 40 years, is that somebody finally put a frame around why data is important. And it's not important from a fact that you have it perspective. It's an economic asset that we're going to put in use to create new sources of value. So if your organization believes that data is this economic force that's going to drive the, the growth in the 21st century, then the single most important question you should ask yourself is how effective is our organization at leveraging data and analytics to power the business models? Now, think about this. It's not asking how effective are you at leveraging technologies like Python or TensorFlow or Spark or Hadoop. No, it's asking very simply, how effective is your organization at leveraging data and analytics to power your business models? Now, when you ask organizations this questions, most folks, they have no idea how to answer this. They, they have no benchmark against which to measure themselves. So I created what I call this data and analytics business model maturity index. Of course, the, the two most important words in that title are the word business model. And what I found out as part of some research I did at the University of San Francisco is that organizations tended to sit along one of five different points on this maturity index. And that most organizations, the starting point, by the way, is in this area of business monitoring. That is where you're using data and analytics to tell you what happened, to build reports and dashboards that provide a retrospective view of the business, that tell you what happened. It's foundational. If you don't have a solid, believable, clean, governed historical perspective, then you're building your house on a, on a, on a platform of sand. The challenge organizations have is how do you transition from reporting or monitoring the business to predicting and prescribing what's likely to happen? How do you go from a world where historically I have 100% confidence that that happened to a world where I'm making probability bets on what is likely to happen? And there's this analytics chasm that's preventing organizations from transversing along this model here. And the problem with this analytics chasm is it's not a technology chasm. We keep throwing technology into this chasm to help us cross from monitoring to predicting and prescribing. It's not a technology chasm. The challenge is it's an economics chasm. And we need to take a value-centric approach, which I'm going to define around use cases because use cases, business and operational use cases, are sources of value creation. And we're going to apply a concept called nanoeconomics to those use cases to help us cross over this analytics chasm to go from reporting on what's likely to happen to predicting what's, you know, instead of reporting what's, what's, what's happened, we're going to move to a world where we're going to predict in a business insights phase at the customer product and operational level what's likely to happen. And if we can predict what's likely to happen, then we can prescribe actions to optimize that environment. So again, we're going to jump over this analytics chasm using a concept called nanoeconomics. We're going to talk about that in a second. And we're going to basically get and drive value and uncover customer product and operational insights buried in our data that we're going to use to predict likely behaviors that we're going to use to prescribe using prescriptive analytics optimization. 
But there's even more here. Once you're using that on a use case by use case basis to uncover these customer product and operational insights, you'll find yourself at the fourth phase here, the insights monetization phase, right? It's not the data monetization phase. It's the insights monetization. You don't necessarily, yes, you can probably sell your data. For most organizations, that's not practical. I'm going to argue for most organizations, that's the lazy way out. No, what you're going to do is you're going to monetize the insights about your customers, your products, your services, your operations, the marketplace. And you're going to take those insights to create new products, to create new services, to go after new markets and new audiences and new channels and new partnerships, to create new consumption models, and new pricing models. It's around the insights that we drive monetization. And finally, the fifth stage, which I used to call digital transformation until I realized that that missed the bigger point. This is not just digitally transforming the organization. This is not basically turning it into a digital centric organization. This, this is about a transformation of the culture to create a culture that can continuously learn and adapt. That in, the, in today's ages, that the economies of learning and my ability to learn and adapt more quickly is more important than economies of scale. And organizations that are gonna be successful going forward are those organizations that can learn and adapt more quickly. That's not only from a technology perspective where I've used AI and machine learning to make assets that can continuously learn and adapt, but it's also about empowering humans. Yes, the human equation here. Empowering humans at the front line of the operations, at front lines of customer engagement, where you, you can bring together the AI and ML interface with the human interface to really create those synergies that drive a continuous learning and adapting organization. That's the opportunity from us. But if you can't cross that analytics chasm, none of this stuff's going to happen. If you can't learn to uncover the customer product and operational insights buried in your data, none of this is going to happen. And if you can't figure out how to master nano economics, you're going to be stuck on the wrong side of the analytics chasm. So what, what is nanoeconomics? What's well, the term I came up with? And what nanoeconomics is, is the economic theory of individual entity predicted behavioral and performance propensities. Whether those entities are humans, teachers, doctors, nurses, students, technicians, right? Or they're machines or devices, wind turbines, jet engines, compressors, clutches, brakes, Right? And what we're going to do is we're going to move decision making in order to cross that analytics chasm. We're going to make transition from making decisions based on averages, replace the part after 3,000 operating hours or everybody above the age of 65 qualifies for a COVID shot. No, instead of making decisions based on averages, we're going to make decisions based on predicted behavioral and performance propensities. Remember, when you make decisions based on averages, at best, you will get average results. We want to basically cross the analytics chasm and make fine-tuned, focused decisions based on these predicted propensities. And this is where this concept of um, asset models, what I call analytic profile, comes in. Because for each of your customers, you're going to start capturing and reusing and sharing and refining each of those predicted propensities. You're going to bring features into your ML models, right? They're going to help you create scores that you're going to use to make decisions to optimize those use cases. In this case, this is a healthcare example, right? So we keep a diet score. How, how good is this person's diet? An exercise score, a stress score. We use those scores, an overall wellness score. We use those scores to predict their likelihood to have a heart attack or a stroke or to catch COVID or to die from COVID. Right? We, we can make precision decisions, not based on averages, but based on people's predicted behavioral and performance propensities. This is the key to cross the analytics chasm and not just crossing the chasm, but navigating along that chasm. So you can uncover these insights that help you to look at your, each of your individual entities, human and device entities, to figure out what new services and products and things I can offer to these people. This is the heart of crossing analytics chasm and the heart of navigating that data and analytics business model maturity index. Let's talk about the concepts of exploiting the economics of data and analytics. Now, I've been in this industry a long time and I've struggled for my 40 years in this industry to figure out a way to how do you attach value to data? And so when I was at the University of San Francisco, I undertook a research project and I had some research assistants and the beauty of research assistants is that they're usually very, very smart. They're usually very, very motivated and they're usually very, very free. And I put them on a quest. I said, I want you to find me an asset in the company, something that sits on the balance sheet 
that looks and behaves like data. So I have a proxy, a model against which I can use to help figure out the, the economic value of data and analytics. So they, my research team went off and after about a week, one of the research assistants came back. She said, Professor Schmarzo, I think I failed. And I said, well, what do you mean? She said, well, data is an unusual asset. She goes, you know, it never depletes. It never wears out. And the same asset can be used across an unlimited number of use cases at zero marginal cost. It's when she said zero marginal cost that it hit me. That the challenge that I had personally, I was so fixated on putting data on the balance sheet as an asset that I was caught in an accounting mentality. And accounting uses a value and exchange asset valuation methodology. So if I were to buy a $30,000 car and the Uber driver next to me was to buy a $30,000 car, from an accounting perspective, it shows up as $30,000 in both of our balance sheets. However, economics is a value in use. Adam Smith, Wealth of Nations, 1776, right? Economics is a value in use, which is why that $30,000 car is worth more to the Uber driver who's going to use that car to create revenue versus me and my $30,000 car that sits in my driveway and never gets driven. And if we make that transition, instead of thinking about data as an accounting asset, but start thinking about it from an economics perspective, not a value in exchange where the value is something determined by what someone's willing to pay for. No, it's a value in use. And how can I use that asset to create new sources of value? When I cross over into that economics mindset, then all these very important economic concepts come to bear. For example, the economic multiplier effect. Now think about the economic multiplier effect, effect from an asset like data that never depletes and never wears out. So for example, let's say I have a customer point of sales data that's been integrated with my loyalty data. So I've got a very rich history of my customers and what products they bought, what prices they pay, what, what stores they've gone to, often they've gone to. I've got a very, very rich perspective and understanding of their, of their buying behaviors and such. Well, the sales team can use that data to improve promotional effectiveness. And that improvement in promotional effectiveness has some dollar value. So I've said, you know, maybe they can improve it by 2.5% and maybe that 2.5% is worth, you know, maybe it's 500,000, maybe it's $10 million. I don't know, it depends on the organization, but here's the key point. By improving promotional effectiveness, I have generated new value, right? Some that set of value has been generated by the addressing and optimizing my promotional effectiveness by using my customer point of sales data. But wait, there's more. Marketing can use that same exact data set to improve customer acquisition by 2%, which is worth, you know, or some percent, right? Right. And they can, and that may be worth, you know, a million dollars, $10 million, $100 million, depends on their business. But here's the key point. Marketing is going to achieve that that ROI, that increase in value at zero marginal cost, they're going to use the same data set that's already been set up and used by the sales organization. They don't have to go out and rebuy it again. They don't have to go out there and reset it all up. It's already there, waiting to be used. And likewise, you can see this again and again, the call center around customer retention and new product development and the product value. You can see time and time again, how that same data set can be used over and over again. And each use case generates value. And I get to use that data at zero marginal cost. So here's a very much an approach that any organization can take. In fact, I would argue that maybe even the, the medium-sized organizations are an advantage here because you have the discipline to go on a use case by use case basis to build out your data and analytics architecture. You don't need to load all of your data into your data warehouse, data lake, data mesh, data swamp, whatever you want to call it. You don't need to build all your analytics. No, on a use case by use case basis, where each use case is business driven. It has accountable and attributable uh, customer product and operational value attached to it. It is an ROI driven process. Each use case, you're going to attack, you figure out what data you need for that use case which won't be all your data. It'll be a sub-segment that's most valuable for that problem you're going after. And what analytics do I need? And again, you won't need all analytics. You only need the analytics against which you're going to attack this problem. So any organization, use case by use case, can, can literally print money as they build out their data and analytics architectures. 
Ah, but wait, there's more. I have a chance to actually not only build assets using AI that never dep that don't depreciate, but I can actually leverage AI to create assets that actually appreciate in value the more they're used. Think about this. I have the opportunity to use AI to create assets that get more valuable the more they're used. And why is that? Because these assets are continuously learning and adapting. Think about an autonomous vehicle. Uh, Tesla has a, you know, an agent, an AI agent that sits inside of it. And it's constantly learning about what's working. Every time it goes down the street, every corner it turns, every car it passes, every, every off-ramp it gets off on, it's learning. These cars are continuously learning and adapting. They're getting smarter. Right? Because they have AI agents inside them that are constantly learning. And in fact, in a Tesla, when even when the AI agent, the autopilot isn't turned on, it's running in shadow mode to make sure it's learning from the driver. It is always seeking to learn. And what happens is every night, all the learnings from those 1 million Tesla cars, everything that they've learned in the day through that they've been driving, get pushed up to the Tesla cloud. They get aggregated and normalized and harmonized and then back propagated back to the car so that any one item, that one thing that one car learned yesterday, the other 999,999 cars now learn. And what's happening here is that Elon Musk and Tesla are mastering the economics of compounding that compounding 1% improvements, 365 times, for example, one time, 1% you know, every day yields at the end of that year, a 38X improvement. It's a game changer. And so what's happening is what we're seeing is this opportunity, and I call this the Schmarzo Economic Digital Assets, Asset Valuation Theorem, which is, this is where the economies of learning, our ability on a use case by use case basis to learn and become more intelligent to continuously learn and adapt become powerful. On a use case by use case basis, what you're gonna find are there's three effects here. Number one, on a use case by use case basis, my marginal costs flatten out because I'm reusing the same data and analytics over again. I don't have to build new ones if they're already out there. And I'm, by the way, I may not be loading all of my data. I may not need all my data. You'd be surprised how little you actually need. The second effect is the fact that by reusing the data and analytics, I can accelerate time to value and de-risk execution. So I can, each use case, I can go faster. And you can see the gap here. That gap alone is pretty impressive. Flat not marginal cost and accelerate time to value. But this idea that I can actually build through AI analytic assets that the more they're used, the more valuable they get, gives us a new effect. This asymptotic effect where any improvement that I make in an analytic module that is used by any other application or use case, any improvements in that analytic module ripple back through so that every one of those use cases just got more effective and they got it at a marginal cost equal to zero. Anyway, thanks for your time. Again, if you have questions, please post them in the, in the, in the chat or the Q&A. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference and take to heart the fact that we are sitting in unique times with respect to how organizations can become more effective at leveraging analytics and data and analytics to power their business models. Cheers.